These five pictures have never been seen together before, uh, not even in the lifetime of the, the sitters. Um, one of them was done for the Bank of Spain, the others were done for the, for the family palace, so they were never brought together in the way they are today. So it's, it's a really remarkable occasion to look at these and think about uh, young Goya as well. These are paintings from the very first phase of Goya's career. Um, when we think of Goya, we tend to think of much more about the later pictures during the wartime and later um, the dark paintings, the black paintings. The, the original idea of the show comes from the portrait behind me, the, the red boy, which is one of the most iconic pictures here at the Met. And very few people realize that the boy's mother across the room is also the Metropolitan, but it's in the Lino collection. The whole story begins with the Count. Um, he was um, the, one of the directors of the, was what was then called the Banco de San Carlos, the Bank of, 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 of St. Charles, which was founded by the King, Charles III, and in the 1840s then eventually became the Bank of España, the Bank of Spain as we know it today. So this is a portrait that was painted for the Bank of Spain. It stayed there ever since. It has never changed hands. It's always been in the same location. And because of that, it's still in remarkable condition. Nothing's happened to this picture. It's in pretty wonderful shape. Um, the Count of Altamira was one of the most noble men in Spain at the time. And he was very well known, however, for his incredibly um, short stature. Um, one of the big, biggest challenges when I was hanging the show was the distance between him and his wife, because obviously the wife is so much taller and bigger that having them next to each other is somewhat strange. The, uh, the Conde of Altamira, unlike the other director who was full length, is shown not standing but seated. And this was because, as Xavier explained to you, he was almost a midget in size. Uh, he's very small. If you look at where his hand is placed on the table, you'll instantly recognize that the table, that he, 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 he's one of those people sits down at the restaurant, the table's in his chin. Uh, and you'll also recognize that there's a certain amount of unaccountable space <laughs> with the cushion. He's levitating. He's levitating <laughs> over the seat. And I would love to know what book he has stuffed under, uh, stuffed under him. Uh, beautiful portrait, never been shown in America before. And uh, so this was a really marvelous event for us. It's normally displayed in the bank in the director's offices, so it's not visible to the public. So this was for the Bank of Spain. The other portraits are for the palace. So this was never meant to hang with her. I think that's an important thing to remember about these two. Um, he is dressed again like his father, and, and he has this French outfit. It's, it's wonderful the way in which the gesture, the, the one we usually associate with Napoleon, the idea of the hand and the waistcoat, is the same between father and son. And in fact, the shoes and, and, and much of the outfit is similar in shape. Um, the wig is exactly the same wig. So there is this idea that he is the heir, and he's obviously um, a sort of miniature version of his father. The younger brother, Manuel Osorio, uh, was seven years younger than Vicente. So he was about three or four years old when this was painted. I mean, it's the most original and the most interesting of the paintings of, in the show, obviously. Because here you really feel that Goya is, is sort of letting loose and, and focusing on the idea of childhood and not really being constrained by a sort of court portrait, portraiture sort of formula, which is what he did with the others. And so he includes all these wonderful details of the animals. Now this is a, is a painting that has been read and reread and interpreted in thousands of different ways. And part of the problem, I feel, is the fact that art historians know that the boy died a few years later. He died when he was nine years old. And in fact, a lot of people have read this painting as being a posthumous painting that was produced later on in the 1790s by Goya when the boy was dead. I think this is very unlikely. I mean, there is absolutely no evidence of anyone in Spain or anywhere else commissioning portraits of dead children. I mean, there was a very high sort of mortality in terms of children, and no one would ever commission a portrait of a dead child, especially if it was a second or third born. Um, and also the fact that he's three to four years old in this painting suggests that it's, that's when it's painted at the same time as the others. So obviously he's very much alive. And all of the iconography, which has been read as a sort of Christian iconography to do with death and resurrection, and uh, the sort of innocence of, ch of childhood destroyed by death and all of that, of course, doesn't make any sense. And I think most of these animals are really pets. There is a whole long tradition of children being shown with pets. Um, because of the enlightened ideas that were going around the court at that time, promoted by the king, it was great for children to be in touch with nature because, it, you know, especially if they lived in a city, it was something that would, would make them masters of, the, of their natural world in some way. And so the idea of the caged goldfinch, goldfinches and, and, the, and the cats 
that very much animals that people would have had in households at that point in Madrid. Goldfinches as well, especially, were well known for singing very beautifully and for being very good sort of tame birds to have. And if you think of the Carol Fabritius um, goldfinch that, from the Moritz house, that you know they had them in Holland, they had them in Italy, they had them in Spain, they were very common pets. Uh, the magpie, I feel, is, is Goya's own joke, and of course magpies are known for stealing objects, and the magpie has in its beak Goya's calling card, and so there is a slight joke within the painting um, which Goya introduced, and it's interesting that he felt free to introduce that joke in the least important of the paintings. This is the youngest boy, definitely compared to the grand portraits of the Count and the Countess, Goya would have never done that in those portraits, so he feels slightly more free to do that. Goya, I think, he was responded to this child, and one of the keys to Goya's portrait when he responded to the sitter, you got an extraordinary characterization. When he did not, you got a likeness. This, I think, is one of the best things. Also, because he was, uh, it was the third child, I think that he was given this great liberty to elaborate upon it. Artist, this is an art historian's field paper. <laughs> and in fact, there is a marvelous article that I glanced at this morning by a man named John Moffat, who has read this as a portrait, that, well, a posthumous portrait after the child was done, dating about 1792, and it's about mortality, the transience of life, uh, and the ways in which uh, a, 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 the child is an emblem of innocence. There's no evidence that families had the third born son when he died uh, portrayed in a posthumous portrait. And the inscriptions that were added uh, shortly after they were painted that identify the, the, the figure, the titles, and the date of the birth, in this case, April 11, 1784, that had he been dead, that would have been, would have been included on the inscription, the year that he died. That would have been the commemorative uh, act of the portrait. The most problematic picture in the show is the one from Cleveland, which I, I wanted to borrow, even though it's something that's usually, for very good reasons, in storage in Cleveland, but again, people don't really see it. This was acquired as a Goya in, in 1946 by Cleveland. Duveen sold it to them as a Goya. Um, Duveen being also the person who sold the Red Boy. And there is a lot of correspondence in the archives in Cleveland with Duveen having this picture restored and then restored again and, and again so that it looks like the Red Boy and he thinks it doesn't look enough like Goya, we need to make it look even more like Goya. <laughs> this whole picture has gone through a lot of hard um, sort of treatment. And in fact, the face is almost entirely repainted. There's not very much left of this painting. It's in pretty bad condition. Um, so this is Juan Maria Osorio, who was the brother in the middle between Vicente and Manuel, and who also died very, very young. And he died in 1785. And this is painted by, I mean, no one really knows who it's painted by, because um, it's obviously not by Goya, even though it was born as a Goya. And so there's been lots of suggestions that it may be by one of Goya's followers or assistants or something like that. And the name of Agustin Esteve was brought up a while ago, who was a man who painted alongside Goya, especially portraits in the 1780s. And I managed to confirm this because I found the Altamira family inventory from the 19th century in which this painting is described as being the work of his statement. So we now know it's definitely by him. But this was probably done in 1785 when the boy dies. And, and, and my feeling is that this was probably started when the boy was alive and then had, as the boy died, he had, he had to be finished. And so some references to the boy, boy's death were included. In fact, the inscription at the bottom says that he dies. And uh, the cage is, is an open cage with a bird flying out. And the word Dios, God, is on, the, is on the cage. So there's a sense of the bird going back to heaven and presumably referring to the boy's uh, premature death. 